hallelujah, glory to God. This is the day the Lord has made. We'll rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. We'll see of the Lord. He's our refuge and our fortress, our God in him. We will trust. All right. So we we looked. Um, anyway, we looked. We have just about, we have a lot to do actually. It's not just about and it's not just some. We have a lot to do. And we're taking it one day at a time because this is how I could go right now. So we're looking today at what um, today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Remember, all of this was one message, so it must blend in, right? Okay, so we need some worship music first thing. Hallelujah, Father. We worship you, Lord God. Father, we ask that you would take control as we as we embark on your study that you, Father, your teaching and just you lead us in a way that you want us to go and you just you take over and you guide us. So just let your words be in front and let my opinions not even matter. Let my let me not give things of my private interpretation, but you alone, Jesus. In Jesus' name. Okay. The ground I'm walking on. All right, here we see. Um, what? What are we going to do? Just a second, okay? Here we go. Um, today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. I need a scripture of peace. I lost my page. This is it here. You more real than the wind in my mouth. Oh, great God, you ring, you ring, you ring, you ring. Hallelujah. Okay. Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Hebrews 3, 15. As it has been said today. Okay. We're reading from verse... 13 to 16. 14 to 16, actually. Oh, 13 to 14. We have come to share in Christ if we hold firmly to the end the assurance we had at first. We have come to share in Christ if we hold firmly to the end the assurance we had at first. I hear him saying something about um, there remains no sacrifice for sin. So we're going there. I belong to you. Hebrews 10:26. Closer than the beat in my heart. Hebrews 10. Twenty-five to twenty-seven. Okay. I'll make you a drink with it, I think. When this melt. Oh Emmanuel. I just feel like worshiping. Anybody feel like worshiping? Okay, Hebrews 10, 25 to 27. Let us not neglect meeting together as we have made a habit, but let us encourage one another and all the more as we see the day approaching. What day? The day of the Lord is coming. Amen? Abba. I belong to you. Read God. First Thessalonians 5 2. Reading from verse 1 to 3. 
I belong to you. Now about the times and the seasons, brothers, we do not need to write to you, for you are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, or peace and security, destruction will come upon them suddenly, like, a la like labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. You know, by the times and the seasons, brother, we need not write to you. There's a season to write. A season for war and a season for peace. Oh, Ecclesiastes 3. To everything there is a season, a time to every purpose under the heaven, a time to born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to get and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to rend and a time to sue. A time to keep silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. What prophet had... Okay, so we're reading from verse 7 to 10 of Ecclesiastes 3. A time to rend and a time to sew. What does that mean? If you rend something, rend this clothes, rip it open. A time to sew, bring it back together. A time to keep silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. What profit has he that work in where that, what, what profit has he that worketh in that where he labored. Okay. So remember, he even, okay, we're even reading verse 10. I've seen the travail which God has given to the sons of men to be exercised in it. I hear him saying we have to train. Okay. So we're training. Listen. And here's why he's saying we, we're training. I hear him saying training in the spirit. So when he said travail, I heard training. So we're going into, um, he says, we have to run the race to win it. I hear him saying something about bodily exercise as well. Bodily exercise, profits, little. Where do we go first, Papa? Bodily exercise, we go first. 1 Timothy 4 to 8. I'm 4 verse 8. So we're reading from verse 7 to 9 in that order. Abba. Oh, Abba. I love your father. Here we go. Okay, um, what are we looking at? First Timothy 4, verse 7 to 9. And he says, But refuse profane and all wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Hold it right there. Refuse profane and all wives' fables. What does that mean? There are a lot of things out there that tells it we've set a pace on those things we've we've built our lives on those things for example you ever heard this one sticks and stones may break my bones but bad words can't hurt me that is a big lie right we know now that we are edified in the word that what words are spirit and if you allow then the words are going to hurt you because the spirit is going to come in and do harm that's why we are, we're trained, we are 
thoughts. We are taught to to reject even thoughts. We are taught to even cancel evil works words that were sent to us. All right. <coughs> oh, just get over. <coughs> oh my goodness. Father, fix my epiglottis. What's going on? Why can't I swallow and speak? <coughs> I sound like a granny. I'm choking. Ugh, ice cream went down on my lung. Okay. So we are taught to reject thoughts because thoughts become what? Words. We're going there right now. I belong to you. Great God. I really choked just now, you know. <laughs> Hallelujah, Father. Hallelujah. 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 Okay. Here we go. We're looking at verse. All this rubbish they have here going on. Like, why? Why do you think the Bible says be transform, be transformed by the renewing of your mind? Whatever you think, whatever you focus on, whatever you meditate on, it's gonna manifest. Darn it. I'm looking for Bible scripture. Ah, oh, come on. There's so many. I know his words. Remember what he said? Um, his words are spirit and life. But we're looking at our thoughts. Our thoughts manifest. The Bible hints us in so many times when he tells us that... Um, <clears throat> I just had one and I just lost it. Father, if you would, give it back to me again. Oh, there we go. Alright, remember what he says. Um, of course, to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And he says that the mind of the spirit loves the things of God, but the mind of the flesh is at enmity with God. It doesn't like God. So again, it comes with thoughts and if you entertain that thought then it becomes something that you believe so when you believe something you're going to do it with all your heart soul and mind and he's calling us to notice <clears throat> i'm gonna find that i'm gonna find something that says okay just a second okay here we go Remember what we were reading just now about old wise feebles? And I said, sticks and stones may break your bones, but words can't hurt me. And that is a lie that we're finding out now because words are spirit. And words will form from thoughts first. Words were thoughts first. Oh. I really choked on that thing, you know? It came through my nose, did it? All right. <clears throat> Remember, he also says that the things of the mouth come from where? The heart. And, of course, the it goes again. It's always like a circle. Because whatever you think, whatever you become knowledgeable about or you know if you believe it whether it's a truth or a lie this goes for both whether it's a truth or a lie you're going to entertain it in the heart and it becomes a belief and when it becomes a belief you put all your effort to it right because you believe it that's why we say we trust it matthew 15 18. Stop. 
feeding me my hair. Matthew 15, 18. Oh, Abba Father. Reading from 17 to 19. Do you not yet realize whatever enters the mouth and goes into the stomach and then is eliminated, it does not defile a man. But the things that come out of the mouth come from the heart. And these things defile a man. For out of the heart comes evil, what is that? Thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality. So first, the first thing that he mentions in Matthew 15, 19, out of the heart comes evil thoughts. And then the actions follow. See? Murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander, you name it. The list goes on. That's a good one. We'll go with that. All right. So in um, in First Timothy 4, he says, um, in verse 7 to 9, he says, But refuse profane all wives' fables. Exercise thyself rather to godliness. You know, these old people have been saying, I'm sorry, not old, not as in disrespectful or anything, but just the grannies and the grandpas. They say, don't put your all your eggs in one basket. And, you know, it's, it's just, it's sayings, but it is so inaccurate. Because if you think like that, then you'll never commit to the person you're supposed to commit to. You'll never, you'll never give your all. So if you say something like that, then it programs your mind to say, well, you know, Granny or Grandpa did say, don't put all my eggs in one basket. So that means I could date this one and that one and that one and this one. And I'll be with this one, but I'll see if this one's working out. And if that one doesn't work out, well, my eggs are not in a basket. Is that what God said to do? No. Here's what 1 Timothy 4, 7, 9 says. Exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Why are we talking about exercise again? Because he's calling us to run a race. Now, for bodily exercise profits little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is, which is to come. Again, for bodily exercise profits little, but godliness is profitable unto all things having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come so listen you can work out all you want you could flex those muscles get your body tight and toned but in the end listen what is it going to profit you you'll have the strength of in the world but what about your mentality strength? What about your spiritual growth? I was saying here, you know what he's saying even? He's saying, listen, you could have muscles and be weak. He said, for bodily exercise profits little. What can you do with muscles? As in the physical sense, not your spirit man growing muscles, because that's the muscles you need to pump. But godliness is profitable to all things. When you have godliness, you're Spirit man is mature. He is growing. He is he is working out then. He is able. That's the word I want. He is able to face all the things of this life. It says having the promise of the life that now is. And what did he promise? What are some of the things God promised about life? That we would we would have it more abundantly. That we um, we are conquerors in him, that we have peace in him, that, you know, all of these little things, we can do all things in him. It is always strong. The spirit man is always ready. It says having the promise of the life that now is. So the life that is now, we have that. And of that which is to come. 
So now that your spirit man is is strong, you know that he's able to what? Endure till the end. Remember what the Bible says about enduring till the end? He who endures till the end shall be saved. He also said, Blessed is the man who endures temptation. Hallelujah, Father. Okay. I've got mush again to drink. <laughs> James 1, 2. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its flower falls and its beauty is lost. That's like us. We are a moment, but he's forever. Isaiah. No, I want Job. I want Job. This this scripture that I'm looking for, it's in Job. I see Job flashing, so we gotta find Job. Job first. Okay, let's see this. Job 19, 25, let's test that one first. Okay, it is beautiful, but it's not what we're looking for yet. By an iron, this is Job 19, 24 to 26. By an iron stylus on lead, or chiseled in stone forever. But I know that my Redeemer lives, and that at the last he will stand upon the earth, even after my skin has been destroyed. Yea, in my flesh I will see God. So he both talks about the passing away of himself and the glorified home that he will later receive. Um, Job 23. Where's the one where he says we are dust? A second, I'll find it. Okay, here we go. We'll use Psalm, Psalms 103, but it's in Job as well, I'm sure. Psalms 103. Oh, there we go. Ah, what is dust that you be mindful of us? is where we're actually going. It's Psalms 103, 14. All right. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He is mindful that we are dust. He never forgets that. He always, he always remembers that we are still in the flesh. But as for man, his days are like grass. He blooms like the flower of the field, and then when the wind has passed over it, it vanishes, and its place remembers it no more. Okay, so that is how we are. That is the perfect example of how we are. We are a moment, like a blooming flower that has reached its point of beauty and then it just oh oh it's it's let's say it's old age or it's it's 
you know, its last stage. And then it withers and it dies and the wind blows it away. And then, of course, that one's forgotten. And wherever the wind blows, the whatever, if it's, it's pollen or whatever, then another one will spring up to wherever God um, brings a soul into the world again. We're forgotten after a while. I mean, if people love us, they'll remember us. They'll do a remembrance or they'll, they'll have a memorial for us. But the, the whole thing is we are like grass. We are, we're like grass. God is forever. We are just a moment. And we have to see that. We have to come into the reality that we are a moment. He can take us out anytime. And anytime he wants. He can allow it. Anytime. You know, he said, um, he gave us some pointers on how to live. And I hear him saying, they are life. So we're going, they are life. Get wisdom, is it? Proverbs 4.22 and John 6.63. Proverbs 4, 20, my son, pay attention to my words, incline your ears to my sayings, who sayings, God's sayings, do not lose sight of them, keep them within your heart. For they are life to those who find them and help to the whole body. He said his words are what? Their life. So remember in First Timothy, he says, drop the feebles of old, the old wives' feebles, and exercise thyself unto godliness. Okay. And in Proverbs 4, he tells us to listen. Pay attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not lose sight of them. Keep them within your heart. For they are life to those who find them and help to the whole body. Okay. That's beautiful. And then, James. James 1, 2. Okay. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its flower falls and its beauty is lost. So too the rich man will fade away in the midst of his pursuits. I hear him saying, you fool. This night, your soul, or the, your soul will be required of you. Luke 12, 20. I will say to myself, I have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take it easy. So some people have this habit of working their tail off and then going into retirement. It's like that, right? You lay up things for the years. Now, it's good. It's not bad. But listen. Uh, it comes a little more after. Let's go before that. A little bit to get the gist of the story where he says he's accumulated so many things, right? Then he told him a parable, Luke 12 16. The ground of a certain rich man produced an abundance. So he thought to himself, What shall I do since I have no way to store my crops? Then he said, This is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and I'll build a bigger, bigger ones, and there I'll store up all my grains and goods. Not smart, is it? Then I will say to myself, so what is he accumulated? Things of this earth. He's accumulated things of this world. Then I will say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take it easy. Relax, 
Snowberry, eat, drink, and be merry. As it was in the days of Noah, what were they doing? They were eating and drinking, right? Matthew 24, 38. So this would have been some of them here in before the flood even, okay? Check this out. And he said, As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage up to the up to the day Noah entered the ark when it started to rain. And they were oblivious, unaware, until the sun, the flood came and swept them all away. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. So people are concerned with things. They want to accumulate things. And then when they accumulate things, they say, so what? God said we'll have life and have it more abundantly. Now, we don't have to worry. Now, we just have to live our lives the way that we want. Because we have enough to go on for the rest of our years. Not thinking, unmindful, oblivious, unaware, until the flood came and swept them away. Now, not mindful unaware, not thinking that any day they could perish and what they've accumulated will go where? All right. Now we're continuing to read Luke 12. So we're Luke 12, 18, and he says, This is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and I will build bigger ones. And there I will store up my grain and my goods. And I will say to myself, you have plenty. Hmm. You have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take it easy. Eat and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This night, your life will be required of you. Then who will own what you've accumulated? I remember we spoke so many times that people forsake their own souls for the sake of pride. They want to be lifted up in what they can gain, what they can accumulate in this world, that they do not seek the treasures that are lasting. The treasures are the fruits. You know, when he when he said the good fruits in the barn, or the harvest in the barn, you take the good fruits and you put them in the barn, and the, bar, the bad fruits, they go into the fire. What are you going to do with bad fruits? I hear him saying a basket of things. Some are good and some are not good. Jeremiah twenty four two. I don't think it's I think it's an Amos. I see Amos flashing in the spirit, so we'll read this first, though. After Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away Jeconiah, Jeconiah, son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, the officials of Judah, and the craftsmen and metalsmiths off from Jerusalem had brought them to Babylon. The Lord showed me two baskets of figs placed in front of the temple of the Lord. Where are these two baskets? They're in the temple of, before the temple of the Lord. Now I hear him say, and the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark. The Ark of the Covenant. Well, something was, was revealed. From his temple. Okay, so we have judgment. 
we have judgment. Mm. Okay, there we go. I found it. Thank you. Okay, so check this out. Two baskets of figs are in front of the temple of God. One basket had very good figs, like the ones that ripen early. Get that word, ripen early. Remember when he said, the stars fell from the sky? Like untimely? It's not time for the fix to fall, but they're falling. Okay, um, okay, so we're looking at Jeremiah 24, and verse 2 says, One basket had very good figs, that, like those who ripen early. I heard like the stars falling from, okay, Revelation 6 13. When I saw the Lamb open the sixth seal, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of goat hair. And the whole moon turned blood red. And the stars of the sky fell to the earth like unripe figs dropping from a tree, shaken by a great wind. It's not time. They're not expecting it. The sky, right, I heard this. This is as well. Um, the sky receded as a scroll. And the temple of the Lord was open or something. The sky receded as like a scroll being rolled up. And every mountain and island was moved out of its place. All right, going back into Jeremiah 24, 2. And it says, one basket had very good figs in front of the temple of the Lord. One basket had very good figs like those that ripen early. And the other basket, but the other basket contained very poor figs. So bad they could not be eaten. I hear the Lord saying, he's talking about the fruits of the Spirit even. A, bit, a bad tree cannot bring forth good fruit, and a good tree cannot bring forth bad fruit. Jeremiah. A bad fruit, a bad tree. Isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen, bow down before him. Okay, we're looking at, you lead me, I follow. He said, what, Jeremiah 24, 2, one basket had very good figs like those ripened early, but the other basket contained very poor figs, so bad they could not be eaten. Do you think this going this is going to the king's table? Do you think if fruits had to be um fruits had to be pr presented as an offering, which one would you think would go? The basket of good fruits or the basket of rotten fruits? Basket of good fruits, right? So I heard him a bad a good tree a bad tree kind of bring forth good fruits and a good tree kind of bring forth bad fruits. Matthew seven eighteen. Likewise, a good tree bears good fruits, and a bad tree bears bad fruits. A good tree cannot bear bad fruits, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruits. Every tree that does not bear good fruits is cut down and thrown into the fire. Every tree that does not bear good fruits is cut down and thrown into the fire. Remember, Father says the axe is laid at the root. Altar. Luke 3, 9. Therefore, Luke 3, 8 to 10. Therefore, produce fruit worthy of repentance. Worthy of repentance. Didn't he say something like, walk in a manner worthy of your salvation? Walk in a manner worthy 
of your salvation as well, right? It's almost the same thing. There we go. Philippians 1, 26 to 28. We're looking at 27. The screen is too a uh, uh, way too bright to watch. Yeah, I can watch it there. Philippians 1, 27. Reading from 26 to 28, and it says, So that through my coming to you again, your exaltation in Christ will resound on the account of me. Aha. Uh -huh. Nevertheless, so who? What does that mean? So that my coming through, so that through my coming to you, remember the Bible says, how will they, um, how will they hear if someone doesn't preach? And how will they preach if they're not sent? And how will they, okay. Romans 10, 15, reading from verse 14 to 16. How then can they call on the one they have not believed? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone to preach? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not all of them welcomed the good news. For Isaiah said, Lord, who has believed our report or our message? Okay, we're going into Philippians 1, 26 to 27. And he said, so that through my coming to you. So he's, he's making it known. This is what he was sent to do. So that through my coming to you, again, your exaltation in Christ will respond, will resound on the account of me. Nevertheless, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or hear about you in my absence, how much more in my absence? You have obeyed me in my presence. How much more in my absence? Philippians 2, verse 12. And he says in verse 11 to 13, And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now even more in my absence. Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act on behalf of his good pleasure. Amen. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Okay, we're going back into Romans. So this is what this is his message. This is what he's telling. We just read Romans. We're going back into Okay, there we go. Philippians 1, 26, 28. Okay, so we're at 27. Nevertheless, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one, what? Spirit. Contending side by side for the faith of the gospel. Side by side. 
without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a clear sign of their destruction, but of your salvation. And it is from God. All right. So what I heard in the spirit was what the ox is laid at the, fruit, at the root of the tree. So we're going in Luke 3, 8 to 10, and it says, Therefore produce fruit worthy of repentance, which is what we just read there. And do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as father. For I tell you that out of these stones God can raise up children of Abraham. The ox lays ready. Oh, the sun just I have to put this thing. The ox lays ready at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. The crowds asked him, What then shall we do? So now they're getting the the gist of the gist of um, what is coming to those who don't bear good fruit, right? And your good fruit is not, um, you know when he said be, be fruitful and multiply? Yeah, some people take that as fruit. But when you come down to, the, to knowing, when you begin to eat strong meat and you begin to see what the fruit of the Lord is, what he desires, it is spiritual. It is not. It. it is not um, physical. I mean, yes, it can it can evolve into physical, but what he needs is the fruit of his spirit. And he said, "Now the axe of God's judgment is poised." The Living Translation says this, though. It's ready to sever the roots of the trees. Why? Because if you are in the vine, then he would be the root, and then you would be nourished, and then you would bear fruit, good fruit, because the root is nourishing that shoot. Just like he said, we were broken off and grafted in, right? But if you're in the wrong root, oh, if you're in the wrong root, if you're connected to the wrong root, if you're, you're being... Uh, nourished by the wrong root, are you going to be a good fruit? No, your fruit is going to be weak. You know, there are some some um, some trees they bear they only bear pure, they bear pure, and that's what Abba wants. And I think he's pointing to the olive tree right now, where he says the olive tree is pure. It's not happening naturally. It's a spiritual thing. Let's just go right there quickly. As he said, um, we're broken off and grafted in. He says the olive tree is pure. So it, it doesn't happen naturally. The olive tree. is not a natural thing. Something like that. Okay, here we go. And it says, Romans 11.24. That fun is, I mean, it's keeping me for school, but it's irritating me now. And if they do not persist in unbelief, Romans 11, 23 to 25, they will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if you will cut from a wild olive tree, and contrary to nature, were grafted, you hear what, contrary to nature, was grafted into the one that was cultivated, how much more readily would these, the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? It is contrary to nature. It is not a natural thing. And he says, I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers, so that you will not be conceited. A hardening in part has come to Israel, unto the full number of the Gentiles has come in. 
to remember this is why all of these things are happening. This is why people are falling away from from God then, who are in Israel. Okay, just a second. So the natural olive tree is not naturally grafted. It is a pure plant and it is barely ever it is maybe unable to be grafted in naturally as well. Because that's what he said. He said, contrary to nature. A wild olive tree, contrary to nature. So it can't be done. Um, but God can do it. Amen? And of course, that's why we say we say by, by grace through faith. Not works, which any man should boast. It's all his work. Uh, okay. Let's not lose sight here. So we're looking at the hardening. A hardening part has come to Israel and to the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Oh, it's so good. Shouldn't put that there. Water and computers don't mix. Okay, there we go. We're going all the way back into the pigs in front of the Lord's temple. Um, Jeremiah, is it? Oh no, let's look up. Jeremiah 24. Two. Now we said one basket had very good cakes like those ripened early, but the other basket contained very poor, very poor cakes. So bad they could not be eaten. Which one you think is going to go into the temple? Which one you think is going to be acceptable for a sacrifice of the Lord? Which one you think is going to the Lord's table? The good things, obviously. And that's where he shows us the bad trees and the good trees bringing forth fruit, right? Jeremiah, verse 3 of Jeremiah 24 says, Jeremiah, Jeremiah, the Lord asked, What do you see? Figs, I replied. The good figs are very good, but the bad figs are very bad. And so bad cannot be eaten. And then the word of the Lord came to me saying, Okay, here we go. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, like these good figs, so I regard as good the exiles from Judah. See? Whom I have sent away from this place to the land of the Chaldeans. I will keep my eyes upon their good and return them to this land. I will build them up and not tear them down. I will plant them and not uproot them. So what is he looking for? The good. Their fruit must be pleasing to the Lord. And of course I heard... Um, the temple was opened and the covenant, okay? We're going to read Revelation 11, 18 to 20. The nations were enraged, and your wrath has come. The time has come to judge the dead and reward your servants. The prophets and the saints and those who fear your name, both small and great, to destroy those who destroy the earth. Then the temple of God in the heaven in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant appeared in his temple. The ark of his covenant. The ark of his covenant. Okay. So the ark, we know it's the box laden with gold and all the fancy things in it. And then we have the rod of Aaron budding. And then we have the the bowl of manna, and then we have, what do we have in there as well? The Ten Commandments. Right? So what is shown in the temple of God? His commandments. Check this out. Then he, then the temple of God in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant appeared in his temple, and there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, and rolls of thunder, and an earthquake, and a great hailstorm. Uh-oh. So remember, these things happened also in Egypt. 
and immediately after you know what we go to we go to revelations 12 1 that says a great sign appeared in heaven a woman clothed in the sun with the moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars on her head she was pregnant and crying out in pain in agony of giving birth now we know that woman is church in revelations so god is pointing us to something the scripture that we're doing today is today if you hear his voice harden not your heart god says there are two baskets in front of the temple one is going to be taken into the temple and the next one is going to be tossed out one is going to be given to good use and the other is going to burn or be thrown into where the garbage is going and god the garbage disposal of god is hell okay remember he said it's the sifting of the wheat and the child is burned into the fire burn into the fire burn into the fire matthew 12 matthew 13 12 11 to 13. i baptize you with fire with water for repentance but after me will come one more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. The Holy Spirit is the fire. His winnowing fork. What is the winnowing fork? You ever saw, um, it's like, hmm. Okay, what is a winnowing fork? It's something that Grandpa had one. It's a fork that can take up the. Uh, it's like a. It's like a. It's like a thing that sips. It's like a thing that sips. Okay, that's easier to. To, it's like a thing that sits. It's like what you go into the fields of the wheat and you shake and they collect the wheat and the chaff falls. It's not even a fork. It's like a, it's like a thing that they sit. Oh. Sometimes they have like, well, it can be like a fork, independent. You know, the, they'll just quickly shake it off and throw it into the heap and shake it in and throw it into the heap like that, right? So... He has a winnowing fork, meaning he has a dividing thing. He's separating wheat from chaff, like um, the word of God. Okay. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear the threshing floor and to gather his wheat into the barn. So remember, the good fruit is going into the temple. Where's the barn? Where's the barn? Heaven. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Where's the garbage going? In hell. At that time, Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by who? By John. Okay. We're going back into Jeremiah. Where are you, Jeremiah? Okay, so we see in Jeremiah 24 where the Lord is showing us that he's showing us two things. He's showing us three things. Oh, he's showing us a lot, okay? <laughs> he's showing us the, the fruit that is presented before the temple of the Lord. So they're, they have baskets in front of the temple. And then he's showing us some are good and some are bad. He's showing us the good fruit is going into a good place and the bad fruit is going into a, a bad place. And then he's showing the people. You see the exiles from Judah who were sent away from this place. And they scattered. Um, last time we were reading about um, the genealogy of Abraham. And uh, it was beautiful. We read 18 chapters last night of Genesis. And, you know, it's beautiful. So we saw how... Um, all of these good people were separated from their land and how, how the bad 
the bad ones. They they took what they wanted, and we we saw the whole thing. Okay, so now we're looking. Here's what God's saying in verse 26, um, verse 6 of Jeremiah 24. I will keep my eyes upon their good and will return them to this land. Return. They're coming back. I will build them up and not tear them down. I will plant them and not uproot them. All right. We're going all the way back into into Hebrews 3 15 we've come to share in Christ if we hold firmly to the end the assurance we had at first as it has been said today if you hear his voice do not harden your heart as you did in rebellion remember he says I stand at the door and knock So many things we have to get here right now. I stand at the door and knock. The sheep hear his voice and they come. I'm the good shepherd. Yeah. Now, God knows his people. And remember, these things, they came one after the other. And it's all about coming to him in, real, in, in the the realness of it, to produce fruit that is worthy of our salvation, to walk in a manner that is worthy of our salvation, to produce fruit that is worthy of repentance. You can't repent for something and then go back into it and just like be like, oh well, you know. You can't repent for something and your heart isn't clean. Okay, we're going into... I could delete this winnowing fork thing, right? Okay. Revelations 3.20. And he says, from verse 19 to 21, those I love. Who? Not those he hates. Those I love. I rebuke and discipline. Therefore, be earnest and repent. How much does God love? He loves the world. For God to love the world, He gave His only begotten Son. Whosoever believed in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. He loves everyone. He says, Do I love? I rebuke and discipline. Therefore, be earnest and repent. Else what? Else rebuke and discipline is coming upon you. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He's standing at the door knocking on who? He's knocking on the heart of the door of your heart. And he says, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and dine with him and he with me. Now, that means your house is empty. If Jesus is not inside, then your house is empty. Then your temple is not housing the one it was made for. So you got to let him in, that he can do the work, that he can make this house all sparkly. Okay, here's what he says. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and dine with him and he with me. He'll come and he'll be with you. To the one who is victorious, I will grant the right to sit with me on my throne. Just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Mm hmm. So just like Jesus is in the Father, he's, he's seated on the right hand of the Father, meaning he's highly exalted. It's to the highest power of, just like we are the sheep of the shepherd. The shepherd will not leave his sheep. The shepherd does not abandon his sheep. He calls his sheep. When he realizes one from the flock is missing, what does he do? He goes after that one.
goes off to that one who's straight from the flock. And the Bible tells us that we are sheep. All of us are like sheep that have gone astray, each to his own way. Matthew 18, 12. So God loves us and he's bringing us into repentance by rebuke if we don't listen. And because he knows the punishment is grave for not re literally grave, as in, I mean, I mean, it was harsh, okay, but I mean, grave as well to death and hell for, for those who are not saved, then he is, he's quickening us by his voice. He's calling us to step into the now and know that, know that that time is coming. Know that we need to get into the boat. The flood is coming. Matthew 18, 12. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, will he leave the 99 on the hills and go out to search for the one that is lost? Will he not? Of course he will. And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he rejoices over, he rejoices more over that one sheep than over that 99 that did not go astray. That is like the prodigal son that we looked at yesterday, where the the son who stayed in the field, he um he was angry that he was angry that the father had kept a party for his brother. And he said, But I was here all the time working my butt off in the field and you never killed a calf for me. You never did this for me. And his father came and said to him, what? He said to him, um, everything that I have is yours. But your brother, my son, who was lost, now has been found. You know, so he was pointing us to Jesus actually coming after, after us. He's coming after us. He's, he's running after us. He wants us. To know him in spirit and truth. He wants us to, well, that's why rebuke is coming. Whenever we run from God, rebuke comes after us in whatever way it comes. If you go in the opposite way God has called you, rebuke comes. I've faced that so many times in my journey coming to Christ. And even as I, what I don't do, what he says, rebuke comes. And then I know that Father is chastening me. And whenever you turn around, he's right there waiting with a robe and a ring. Okay? So, like the prodigal son, he goes after his sheep because he loves each one. And the Bible says that all of us, like sheep, have gone astray, each to his own way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. All right. So if we went our own way, Isaiah 53, 6, reading from verse 50, from verse 5, 7. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that bought, peace, uh, bought us peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. We... All like sheep have gone astray. Each has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the what? The iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted. Yea, he did not open his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. As a sheep before a share set a silence and he opened not his mouth. All of us, in some way, have gone astray from the Lord. At some point, you did your own thing at some point. But Abba didn't just leave us there. He didn't leave us to go our own way because he said in his word, there is a way that seems right unto man, but the end thereof is destruction.
Proverbs 14, verse 12. So from 11 to 13. And he said, The house of the wicked will be destroyed, but the tent of the upright will flourish. There is a way that seems right to man, but the end is the way of death. Even in laughter, the heart may ache and the joy may end in sorrow. Remember yesterday when we spoke about you can be laughing your head off. You can be showing that you're happy so people could see you're happy. But if you don't have Christ and you don't know happiness, happiness is not in your heart. If Or you can, um, you can be doing all the things in life that you think will bring you joy. But it comes down to it and you lose those things that you have then your joy cease. Because you don't really have him. And the presence of the Lord brings what? Joy. The fullness of joy. Okay. Um, what was I saying before that? Right. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each our own way. Yeah. We're looking at um, John 14, 6. So, remember he says in Proverbs 14 that there's a way that seems right unto man, but the end thereof is destruction. So, if God left us on our path, where would we go? We would go into destruction. God bless you, Brother Saul, and Sister Rovina, and Don, and Brother Mark. Okay. God says, there is a way that seems right unto man. It seems right, but it's not. And if you go down that way, destruction is waiting for you. Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Remember when he said that in John 14, um, 6? I don't know why they keep pushing this NIV in my face, man. Give me the King James Version. John 14, 5 to 7. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In other words, any other thing is what? Any other thing is the wrong way. Any other thing is a lie. And any other thing is death. Right? That's the opposite. So John 14, 5 to 7. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? How can we know the way? When I hear that, I immediately hear, how can we know Jesus? <laughs> That's just beautiful. That's why I smiled. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You're not going to inherit eternal life without Christ. You're not going to come to the Father. You're not going to come to the fullness of knowing who He is if you don't receive the Son and the sacrifices of the Son. No one comes to the Father except through me. No one enters heaven but through my blood. No one goes to the Father. No one comes to my throne except through the Son. Listen. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. Why? Because he is the Father in the flesh. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Now he's talking to not just Philip, he's talking to Thomas. Thomas, you know him and you've seen him. Thomas said, how can we know the way? Turn it around. How can we know Jesus? Jesus said, I am the way. Jesus means the Lord our salvation. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And Thomas, from now on, you do know the Father, and you have seen me. Wow. Okay. Um, the other one, um, just a second. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Okay, I read that. Did I leave out any? 
I just closed down that one for no reason. So I'm working five to seven. Okay, here we go. Um, we read Isaiah. So now, okay, here we go. He said, the sheep hear my voice. So when we go our own way, whatever we go into, whether we go into sex, which is so very popular, whether we go into drugs, whether we go into alcoholism, whether we go into um, gangs, gangs, whether we go into, um, or so many things, so many things, or so many things, adultery, stealing, criminalism, or whatever, whatever, wherever we go into in the world. And it's not just these extreme that, you know, a judge has to catch you and throw you into jail for it. No. Whatever you seek in the world, if God left us there and did not come after us, we would be going on the wrong way that leads to destruction. But Father doesn't want us going that way. He says, no, I want you going this way. This is the way that leads to life. And it is not crooked. Remember, the Bible says that the path of the wicked is crooked. But the way of the righteous is Proverbs 2.15 From those who enjoy, verse 14 to 16, from those who enjoy doing evil and rejoice in the twistedness of evil. What does the serpent like to do? Twist. What does he like to twist? Words. So listen. Where does he attack? Where does he attack? Does he attack the mouth? He attacks the mind. He is a spirit being. He is a spirit. He's a disembodied spirit. He is an unemployed cherub, ex-cherub of the Lord, and he's rebellious. So Proverbs 2, 14 to 16 tells us, From those who enjoy doing evil and rejoice in the twistedness of evil. What does that mean? When Satan went to speak to Eve in the garden and she said, The Lord said, If we eat from that tree, the fruit we will die. And not even touch it. And Satan said, did the Lord say that? He said that, but uh, he didn't mean that. He just knows that you'll become like him. Knowing good and evil. He said the truth, but he twisted it. Because after he said that, he said, you will not surely die. No, you will be like God. Isn't that why they twist the truth? Because they exalt themselves above God. They cannot come down to the humble that everyone has to come to no they're in pride they're operating in pride but father says listen that way that you're going is wrong and if you don't come back then you're going to be destroyed my son my daughter come and he's calling us back I want you this way but you're going this way yeah so father says don't listen to the serpent because he loves to twist things. And Proverbs 2.15 shows us um, in verse 14. What I was talking about was Genesis 3. Um, Proverbs 2.15. From those who enjoy doing evil and rejoice in the twistedness of evil. The God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers. That they should believe a lie and not the truth. Because the love of the truth is not in them that is where's that yeah the god of this world second thessalonians is it no second corinthians for for that they should believe a lie yeah second thessalonians too as well okay so 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 tells us 
even if our gospel is hidden or veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing because the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. They don't care about it because they want to be their own God. And if they have to submit to the message of the cross where Jesus said, come as you are, but don't leave as you came. Because my blood is going to wash you. My spirit is going to fill you. And you're not going to be the same. But how can you receive that message if you're hell-bent? You hear that? Hell-bent. The way of the, the wicked is what? It's crooked. It's not straight. If you're hell-bent on following after Satan and the things that he gives, how can you return to the Lord and make straight his path? The Bible says, prepare the way for the Lord and make his path crooked. Right? No. The Bible says, prepare the way for the Lord and make his path straight. Because narrow and straight is the way that leads to heaven. The Father sees you walking down that road and he, he's, he's the Alpha and the Omega. He is seeing ahead in the road, there's a ditch. Oh, there's a ditch. There's a bottomless pit in the in the road ahead. You can't see that. You're joy riding. Life is dandy now. You're joy riding. Woo! What a ride! Woo! -hoo! Right? But God is watching and He's seeing the ditch and the path. You know when you have a puzzle and you take one side this way and one side that way and then it'll lead you into a dead end the dead end is the ditch there's no coming out of the ditch because after death is what judgment right so father's looking down now and he's seeing the joy riding Woo, life is a party yay everywhere it doesn't matter what god said let's twist the truth a little let's give the truth but let's let's twist it a little why because that's what Satan does best. He loves to twist the truth. All right. Second Corinthians 4, 4, reading from verse 3 to 5. And if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers that they cannot see the light of the gospel of glory of Christ, who is the image of God. They're blinded. They can't see the light. So what are they doing now? They're walking on this crooked path in darkness. Because where does the blind, how does the blind walk? Sometimes they have guides, right? Didn't Jesus say you blind guides? Why? Because they're leading people astray. They're leading them astray. There's a ditch ahead. There's a ditch ahead. And when you go into that ditch, you're not coming out. Wow. You blind guide. Let's go there. Really quickly. The everlasting God. Matthew 23, 24. Grow weary. What do you scribes? And Pharisees, only far as you see. You're not thinking ahead. Satan has blocked off your mind and you can't see anything beyond it. Woe to you, scribes and far you see. Pharisees, okay? You hypocrites, you pay sides of mint and dill and cumin, but have disregarded the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. Unbiased, forgiveness, loyalty. Listen, you should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. What does that mean? What does that mean? The letter. Remember the letter? The letter is the written part. But, okay, you, have, you should have practiced the latter, the later, the one that was coming after. Just like John said, I baptize with water, but he baptizes with fire. Just like we were given the words of God 
um, in these tablets of stone, um, the, the, a peak of the glory of God in these tablets of stone. And of course, he took that away and he, writ, he wrote it on our hearts when we received the Holy Spirit. So now we don't want to fall into... I don't have a word. <laughs> we don't want to fall into the opposite of what the glory of God is, of what the peak of God that we got, the holiness of who he is. We want to fall in line. So Jesus is telling them, you should have... Hey, open. You blind guide, you strain out an, a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside it's full of greed and self-indulgence. Again, we come down to this word, pride. Pride. Pride has your joy riding in the wrong path. Pride has you going into a way that God did not call. Pride, but you're, no, this is the way that God called. But this is the way that they're joy riding. And the ditch is right there. But because you're blinded, and who is, who is your blind guy? Satan. Satan says, you know, ah, it's okay. Well, it doesn't matter. No, it's okay. God says that, but this is okay. Grace is given. Just go there. Because he wants you where? He wants you taken out. He wants you taken out. He wants you in that ditch. Because he does not get to go back to heaven. We get to. He doesn't want you to find the way before you fall into the ditch. But I have good news. The good news is Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. John 14. Let's go there. Come on. Didn't I just get it? No? Did I delete it? Okay, fine. I'll just type it again. Okay, John 14. So Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Now, while you're joyriding, this is the love of the Father now, while you're joyriding on your merry path, that seems right to you, and there is a way that seems right to man, but the end thereof is destruction. It's coming. It's not there yet. Satan's making it shiny. Oh, touch it. Just touch it. Just touch it. And then you'll bite it. And then you die. Yeah? So... Satan is your blind guide in front and Jesus is coming now because this is the love of the Father. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray, each to his own way. And Jesus is coming now because you've taken the guide of Satan and you're heading to a ditch. Father has sent the Son. He has come down himself. And He's not come down in a way that you'll be scared of him. More like Adam and Eve ran from, and hid from him. No. He's come down in a way that you'll run to him when you see him. So you'll put up brakes on the car. Just stop. Turn it around. And hear the voice of Father calling. John 14, 5 to 7. Thomas said, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you knew me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you know, you know him and have seen him. Of, clo of course, just like he's on the, the throne and the cherubims, they hide his glory so the universe isn't consumed because he is a consuming fire. Listen. Um, just like that, he veiled himself in flesh. It's a beautiful thing when you begin to realize, you know, you can't stop smiling from ear to ear. You don't care. It's like, what? Your father veiled himself and came down just for you. He came down and he said, Carrie, not that way, love. Come here. Come this way. Come. 
like, are you hurting enough? Do you realize? Are you ready to give up your stubbornness? Are you on your knees now? Are you ready to listen to me when I speak? I'm speaking to you, daughter. Come. Come. Just come. Don't be afraid. Lift up your head and just come. He's like, I've been here all along. And then he comes. You turn around. You're hearing him saying, come. So you turn around. And behold, he's coming after that one that strayed from the flock. And you see the way coming after you. You see him coming after you like you're some treasure. <laughs> like you're some treasure that he lost. And he's so adamant on coming after you. He, he, he's not stopping. And as he comes closer and closer and as you draw nearer and nearer, the darkness begins to flee. You begin to see Satan at the back and you don't look back. You hear him saying, ah, oh, come, come, we're almost there. You know, come, he's calling you, we're almost there. Just turn around one more time. But the Bible says no one, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of heaven. You can hear the voice all you want, but the Bible says what? That Satan is calling that way. Resist the devil and he shall flee. We turn our backs against him. All right? We turn our backs against him. We shut him up. And we send lies into the pits of hell. Now, in 2 Thessalonians 11. two, eleven. sorry. 11 to 13. So 10 to 13. 2 Thessalonians 2, 10 to 13. The shepherd is calling you by name. He knows your name. He named all the stars. He numbered all of them. He knows all the hair in your head. How many of you tried to count the hairs on your head? Anybody want to count mine? I know when you're finished. <laughs> okay, 2 Thessalonians 2, 10 to 13. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth. And who's the truth? Jesus. That they might be saved. For this cause, God shall send them a strong delusion. Satan went and he asked for Job, didn't he? God gave permission that they should believe a lie. That they all might be damned who do not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Again, pleasure over purpose. You've switched it. Oh, this looks better. Oh, that's better. God says do this. No, this looks better. You are playing with God. You're playing with pleasure and purpose. Pleasure is not something to play with. If pleasure doesn't come from God, it's dangerous. Now listen. In verse 13 of 2 Thessalonians 2. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you. Brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God has had from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. Now what is he saying about the beginning? He said, Blessed are they whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. From the very from, from before the very foundations of this world, remember? Remember, he said, Before you were in your mommy's womb, I knew you. Remember, he said, I have chosen you. You have not chosen me. I called you as a prophet to nations. Yeah, I have said, Where are you? And I said, Here I am. God is calling us, He's called us, and now we're straight. We've gone to our own way. But the Father is saying, freedom is here. Freedom. Freedom. <laughs> freedom will set it down. Freedom is here. Come. And he says, when you get tired, when you get weary enough, you hear his voice calling you. The voice of the shepherd. Have you had your fun? Have you had your fun wandering around? 
Have you had your fun? Have you done enough in the world? Do you think it's enough? Is it time to come home to the shepherd now? Are you done people pleasing? Are you done trying to fall into the crowd? Or are you ready to stand out the way God made you to shine? Are you ready to really stand out? Then turn around and see the good shepherd. Because he's right behind you. He never left you. His eyes never left you. And now he came down to get you. Because he gave us a choice. And if you choose him, you choose life. And if you have him, you have life. I hear him saying, he who has the son has life. We're going there. Let's see what it says. John 1, 5 to 12. 5 verse 12. Reading from 11 to 13. And this this is that testimony. God give, has given us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I have written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have what? Eternal life. Amen? Eternal life comes from Jesus and no one else. Eternal life is given off the cross. And if you don't believe that, then I'm sorry. You believe in the way of death. And that's exactly where you're heading down. And if you don't turn around, because it's all your choice. Father loves you. He'll rebuke you. Bring you to situations where you kneel. And if you don't kneel and say, this is the way of the Lord and he's called me to this. Then you're going to pay dearly for it. Now, Father has done all he can. And he's, he's still doing. Oh, man, he's still doing. He gave us the gift of his spirit. He's calling us by name. He's brought us into situations. He's bringing us to our knees. He's doing all he can without forcing his will upon us. Using his will. And he's put it in such a gentle package. He's put it in such a gentle package. He went from the throne to the earth in the form of one of us so that he could teach us his ways and he could dwell amongst his creation because he loves us so much. He loves us so much. He doesn't want to leave us alone. <laughs> he loves us. And he came and dwelt amongst his creation. The word became flesh and gently he met us at the well. He met us at our point of infirmities. He met us at the point of no return. He met us broken. He met us dead. He met us, oh, he just came and he met us. He made appointment after appointment to every situation that we have. And then he said, that you may know my fullness, the fullness of my love. That you may know who I am. Who do you say I am? That you may know who I am. Father said, I came and I died for you. I went on the cross and I hung there for you. Because I defeated everything that could possibly take you to hell. And all you have to do is look up. And my voice gently calling, saying, come unto me, all who are weary and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my youth. I hear him saying, oh, all my pores are raising. Okay, here we go. Come unto me. Oh, where am I typing? Come on. Father is gently calling each one of us. Not like he said, Adam. Where are you? And Adam said, Woo! Yeah, I know. Oh, no, it's a laptop. So, I don't know what, I don't, whatever. Whatever the image, once you can hear my voice. Okay? And it's probably with the signal, I don't know. Focus, just focus. Um, 
Don't make me lose it. Okay. <laughs> Come unto me, all who are weary and are heavy laden. He said, um, Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28. So we're going Matthew eleven twenty-seven 27 to 29. Father is gently calling us, each one, by name, in the situation, just as we are. He says, don't be ashamed. Just come. For all things have been entrusted to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows who the Father is except the Son. And those whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. Here's what He said. Come to me, all you who are weary and are burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Give me the King James Version of that. You people, remember your children. Your grace is enough. You grace is enough. Okay, and he says, All things are give, delivered unto me by my Father, of my Father. No one knows the Son but the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father unless the Son, and he to whom the Son will reveal him. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. Ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. There we go. All right. So Father goes upon the cross and he says, Carry for all the times that you did not listen to me, for all the times that you chose evil, for all the times that you were weak and faithless and just undeserving. This is for you, my child. That the day you realize that there is no, not, no other foundation. There is no other foundation that can hold you up but me. That I am the rock. That I, God, am your salvation. From the depths of the grave to the pits of hell. From any situation that you could face. From grieving for your daughter. From grieving for your husband. For persecution. For rivalry. For anything. Carry carry and you hear the shepherd and you go from here to there and you say abba you know me by name abba you love me the way that i am abba you hear you call abba if you hear him knocking on your heart saying the things that you're doing it will never amount to enough to get to heaven but the thing that I did for you, it is enough. It is enough. The thing that I did for you on Calvary's cross is enough. Because it was the required price. And I paid it in full for you. And our Savior is gently calling each one of us by name. Remember the Bible says he knows those who are his. He knows his own. He says, I know you by name, and I called you. So come on to me. John 10, verse 3 to 5. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name, and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them. And his sheep follow him because they know his voice. And they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will flee from the stranger because they do not recognize his voice. Now greater is he who lives inside of us than he who is in the world. Amen? And... So when all the ways of the world are calling, all the ways 
and you hear just one voice calling, and that is the voice of Jesus. And he said, no other man laid down his life for me. The Messiah has come, and he's about to come again and take his people home. Where do I want to go? Uh, do I want to stay with these who have done nothing for me? What they've done is nothing compared to what he did. He loved me in my sin. He loved me at the time I was most unlovable. He loved me at my darkest hour. He loved me in my deepest sin. Oh, just feel the love of the Savior now. Just feel, just feel the Holy Spirit in your heart right now. He loved you in the worst point of your life. And he said, come. His arms were still opened. His arms are still opened. Oh, beloved, won't you hear the Savior today calling? He's calling. I know somebody's going to be touched right now. Get ready. Father is calling you to say whatever you, you went into, whatever you got involved in, whatever stupid decisions you made, whatever things you didn't think out clearly, whatever things you invo you, you um, rejected my voice for, it's not okay, but come. I've made a, I've, I've paid a price for you. And if you come humbly, I'll wash you. He said, I'll wash you. And I have a robe waiting for you, just like I did the prodigal son. And I'll pick you up into my arms, my lamb. And I'll rejoice over you more than those who are already in my flock. Because there is nothing more pleasing to me than for you to come unto repentance. To turn yourself around and hear my voice and come. And come because I know you and you know me. I am the good shepherd. And you turn around and you can't even take the first step. So you fall to your knees realizing that you're not worthy. Anybody want to do that right now? I hear the Spirit speaking. We're going on our knees right now. Ah. Come on. You fall to your knees not, reali not realizing that come on go on your knees you fall to your knees like come on go on your knees wherever you are you fall to your knees realizing that nothing you could do in your life could amount to what he's done on the cross nothing can bring you into heaven nothing and no one could love you the way that the savior loves you Nothing and no one showed you that amount of mercy. No one has taken you at your lowest point and said you're perfect. Come, I know you. I made you. I see the perfection. I see what I made. I know the beauty. Give to me your brokenness. Nothing and no one has done that for you but the Savior. Would you today come to him? When you hear his voice calling you, and he's calling you by name, he's saying, George, Joey, Saul, Mark, and everybody else who would come there, come. Rovina, he's calling you by name, sister. Every one of us who would come, his arms are already open. Even if you know him, this may be a thing. You might have backslidden. Maybe you backslid. We all backslide. I backslid. How many times I backslid? You guys have seen it. But the Lord doesn't make me go down to my face like stumbling and crashing. He upholds me with his righteous hand and he said, come. Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Just bow your head in prayer right now, wherever you are. Let us pray. Let us thank him for his mercy, his grace. His grace is sufficient. His love. If we turn on the right path, he can do the work in us. He will set the work in us on the straight and narrow because that's the path to heaven. It's not all the things that you think 
you're seeing and going after. No. Father says, my way is sure and it's me. And it's straight and it's narrow. It's not easy, but it's okay. Because the rewards, oh, the rewards are, they're going to be worth it. The rewards will shine from glory to glory. Father, let me just make sure I didn't leave out anything that you gave. Oh, first thing. <laughs> One more, okay, two more things. He said in his word in, okay, two, wow, look where he brings it in. Okay, Matthew 24, 13. I'm on the ground now. <laughs> Matthew 24, 13. And he says, reading from verse 12 to 14, he says, Because of the multiplication of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But the one who perseveres till the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a testimony to all nations and then the end will come and then he says the other one first corinthians 9 24 i do this all for the sake of the gospel so that I may share in its blessings. Do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way as to take the prize. Everyone who competes in the games train with strict discipline. They do it for a crown that is perishable, but we do it for a crown that is imperishable. Wow. Okay, I'm coming back up. He gives me so much here again. Okay, so let me just go through, make sure I've given all that he's given. The point of being on your knees, people. You've got to learn to get down on your knees. So he said, run the race to win it. And he said, train the heart. You got to train. Remember he said, if I stand at the door and knock, calls you by name. Are you there? Can I come in? He's a gentleman. He doesn't force himself. He's beautiful. And if you let him in, it's going to be the greatest thing of your life. To let Jesus in your heart. Your life will never be the same. You can reach the lowest low and he'll, he'll lift you up till you're the highest high. It's just how he is. Now, um, there's just one more thing that I have to say. Just one more thing. I have I have minutes, so I can go. Um, where he said, run the race to win it. Remember, we were looking at bodily exercise. Profits a little, but we are to train the spiritual man. And for the spiritual man to be trained, who, who are you trained by? You're trained by a trainer. You're trained by someone who is a professional in what they do, right? So when the professional comes in, he's going he's gonna to give you everything that you need to win the race. So right now, we are in the race, all of us. And the professional trainer who has who you have to sign the contract with who you have to allow in to train you is none other than Jesus Christ if you receive him he'll come in and he'll dine with you he'll teach you all that he is and just lead you in the way he'll strengthen you you'll never be the same but if you don't let him in the serpent is going to come again and go like, I could train you you know I could train you, really. No, but he's the imitation lion. He's the imitation young lion. He cannot train you to be a lion. He could train you to be a rookie. And that rookie 
will lead you down the wrong path and throw you into the ditch. We don't want the rookie. We want the line of the tribe of Judah. Amen? We want a heart that is strong. We want a mind that is focused and geared. We want what God is. We want the Spirit of God inside of us, dwelling inside of us. And as we hear His voice, because He's calling, He's saying, come. He says, gently, my voice is calling. I went on the cross and I died for you. I did it for you and you alone because I knew exactly what you would need to run this race. I knew the training that you would need. So I came down that you might behold my love. And it is enough. Ah, Brother George, let's go. Let's pray together. Amen. Everybody, let's pray. Let's just thank God right now that he's knocking on the door of our hearts. That he is the good shepherd. And he'll not forsake us, but he'll lead us. He's with us. His voice is calling us by name right now. Come on. If you have to get on your knees, go on your knees. My Father, we come in your awesome and most precious name, Jesus. Lifting you up as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, as our personal trainer, Lord God. You are equipping us to run the race to win it, Father. You are strengthening the spirit man inside of us, Lord God. You're showing us that we must produce fruit worthy of repentance and walk in a way that is worthy of salvation, Father. You're showing us, Abba, Father, that it's only your spirit that can quicken us. And how will we receive your spirit if we don't receive you, Father? How could we receive you if we don't open the door of our hearts and let you in? Father, your word says today, if we hear your voice, harden not our hearts but open unto you, and you'll come in and you'll dine with us and we with you. Father, right now, as you knock, you knock on the door of our hearts, and you call us by name, and you say, will you let me in, my child, that I may come and sup with you and you with me, that we may have long talks and long evenings together, that we may just begin the work and we may quicken the work and we may open your eyes and just lead you in the path that leads to eternal life. Would you let me in tonight? Would you let me in today? Would you let me in this evening? I call, I call you by name because I know you. And you've found me in this place where only mercy can find you. Only I can find you. You found me, the rock, the foundation that does not fall. Everything else around will fail you, but I will never fail you. My name is faithful and true. I am the good shepherd. My sheep know the sound of my voice, and they come to me. And you are one of the sheep of my fold. And I knew you cried out for me. And I knew you didn't want to go that way. But Satan deceived. But I am the light of the world and the salt of the earth, and I've come to season that which is unsavorful and to shine in the darkness that you may see me and come to me. I know you've been weary. I know you're tired. But I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. I have come that my strength is made perfect in weakness. I have come that your darkness may dissipate and flee. I have come that you would know that I am Father and I am Savior. And I knew from the very beginning that you would need this strength. So I went upon this cross that at the hour that you cry out for mercy, that you cry out for help, that help has been given from the very foundations of the world because I know you. And you know me, and you come. But Father, as we we just receive all that your word says, Lord God, as we receive all that you are guiding us into, as you just beautifully reveal yourself even more, Father, that you are the one knocking on the door of our hearts, ready to train us for the race, and training us, and keeping us, and strengthening us, strengthening our muscles to run the race, our spiritual man with God. 
We open the door of our hearts now, Lord Jesus, and we say, come in and never leave. Because you said you'll never leave us or forsake us. But you'll be with us, you'll dine with us, and we with you. You'll quicken us in the way that you show us, Father. You'll quicken us this day. Thank you for coming after us and not leaving us to perish in the way that we chose. Thank you for knowing the way that we ought to go. Thank you for being the way that we ought to go. And the truth and the life, you're everything that we need. And we just thank you, Lord God, for the gift of your Holy Spirit. And you are with us always, Father. And we will hear the voice say, this is the way, walk in it. And we'll turn around from the path that was crooked and go into the straight and narrow. And it's never too late until death comes and destruction and judgment will come after it. Right now, quicken us with your Holy Spirit. Lead us in the way that you show us how. And we'll follow you all the days of our life. In the mighty and most precious name, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. And just like that, he comes in and he stays with us. He said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. I'm with you till the, even the end of the world or the age. I love it. I got dizzy just there. Um, as Father quickens us, we just come boldly to his throat now. And do you know that even as we come, we can come shy. We can come with our head bowed down because we don't deserve anything that he gave. We don't deserve anything that he provided. But he did because he knew exactly what we would need. And he quickened us in that way. He pulls us gently to him. And we come. And now we're in the secret place. The place, the place of good pasture and still waters. And this peace that surpasses every understanding and fear is cast out. Every evil thing, every lie of the serpent is cast out. Because he is the Lord God, the Lord strong and mighty in battle. The one who fights for us. Amen. I hope you'll gain something from this. I hope you'll learn something, take something. Sabbath is coming. Turn on to the way that is he and he will surely keep us. He will help us to run the race to win it, and we will endure to the end in Him. In Jesus' mighty name. Shabbat shalom when it comes, beloved. Hallelujah. God bless you. In Jesus' mighty name.